of the Packard Motor Car Foundation. And he joined the Packard Motor Car Foundation board in 2013 as president. He held that position through 2018. He began volunteering at the Packard Proving Grounds in 2001. And today, he's vice president and committee chair for finance, grant writing, and accreditations. He's a life member of the Packard Automobile Club and a 25 plus year member of the Classic Car Club of America. He earned a BS and an MBA in finance degree from Wayne State University. He owns two 1941 Packards. One is a convertible sedan and the other is a business coupe. So I will say one thing, uh, one housekeeping item before Roger gets started. If you do have a question that comes up over the course of Roger's presentation, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And we will get to as many questions as we can at the conclusion of Roger's remarks. Without any further ado, let me introduce Roger Luxick. Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate this opportunity to explain to the folks tuning in to the At Home series about what we've been doing out at the Packard Proving Grounds. And by we, I mean the Packard Motor Car Foundation. I'm just one of the many volunteers that work out there. I've been doing it now going on almost 20 years. And uh, it's really been a labor of love for everybody on our team. This at home series, I gotta tell you, is uh, very handy. I've tuned into a lot of them. I like what you've been doing. And I wanted to see how I could help and explain to others what we're doing out at the Packard Proving Grounds. As you know, it's um, all virtual now, and I'm getting the best mileage ever I ever had on my car. Let me start off by showing you what the Packard Proving Grounds looks like today. We've got a large gatehouse up here that was the first building constructed, a repair garage, and during World War II, uh, there was a building added known as the tank test building, and we'll get into that as we go through the slides. First, a little history about the Packard brothers. Two brothers, William Dowd Packard, James Ward Packard, lived in Warren, Ohio. Very industrious guys, very smart guys. The father owned a hardware store that they took over, and they were in business in, 18, in the early 1890s already selling hardware goods, but got into that new invention, electricity, and were making light bulbs. Became pretty wealthy off of that. And in 1899, they formed the Ohio Automobile Company, and they built their first Packard automobile in Warren, Ohio. And they did this because he had previously owned a Winton, and they were always returning to the factory, and finally the folks at Winton said, you know, if you guys are so smart, why don't you build your own car? We're tired of fixing this thing for you. And that's what they did. They took his advice and built their own car. By 1903, it had gained such popularity that it drew the attention of uh, Henry B. Joy and a group of investors, among them Russell and Fred Alger, Truman, John Newberry, and Philip McMillan. And here we see Henry B. Joy tooling down East Grand Boulevard with Fred Alger at his side, and uh, they're taking a little test drive and a, and a, a brand new 1909 Packard. The plant they built became world famous. This is the Packard plant in the, in the early teens. In the foreground is Concord Avenue and going off to the northwest, southeast is East Grand Boulevard. This building later grew through a series of developments to over a million square feet. Uh, and this was all designed by Albert Kahn and used the world's first precast, excuse me, poured in place concrete uh, building system. Packard had a lot of firsts. Now the title of this was Packard for uh, Proving Ground First, but I'm gonna tell you the number of Packard Firsts to begin with. If you remember the stick shift on your car, for those who still have a stick shift, that H pattern was developed by Packard in 1900. They had the first steering wheel in a car. 
Before that, you only steered by a tiller, like on a sailboat. In 1915, they introduced the world's first V12 engine in an automobile. They set world's records, 149, almost 150 miles an hour in a 1919 Packard race car. First car to have four wheel brakes in mass production. 1934, everybody's got serious radio in their car. Well, Packard in 34 had the very first car wired, pre-wired to accept an optional radio. In the fall of 1939, they introduced the 1940 models of Packard. Who today doesn't have air conditioning in their car? You could probably count it on one hand. Well, they were the first to have air conditioning. Started with the 1940 model year, and it was optional price, $275. Toward the end of their history in Detroit in 1955, they developed a very unique suspension system. It was no springs, and the car was held in place and gave it an excellent ride with a new torsion level bar suspension. Prior to World War II, Packard was known as the, was the leading luxury automobile manufacturer in the United States. They routinely outsold Packard and Lincoln, and in many years, Packard and Lincoln combined. They owned the luxury car market. This is one of the reasons they were known as the master motor builder. Besides building motors for cars, they also built air aircraft engines and marine engines. Long history with aircraft engines began in World War I when they designed a, a V-12 engine known as the Liberty engine for the aircraft of the day. In 1928, they set a world's record by building the very first diesel engine for airplanes. It broke a number of records. We'll talk about that in a minute. World War II, for the arsenal of democracy, Packard collaborated with Rolls-Royce to build the Merlin engine. And when Rolls-Royce brought the engine to America to work with Packard, it was developing an astonishing 1,050 horsepower. But through continuous improvement and testing, by the end of the war, when they had built nearly 58,000 Merlin engines, they more than doubled the horsepower to 2,280. I could give a day-long lecture just on the Merlin story and what Packard did to help win World War II. Moving on to marine engines, they built the most powerful and Gar Wood, famous race boat driver of the uh, 20s and 30s, spec every one of his boats with Packard engines. And he set a world's record in Miss America II First boat to go over 120 miles an hour and set an eventual world's record at 125. And four Packard supercharged V12s were in that boat, Miss America 10. During World War II, Packard, again, as part of the arsenal of democracy, was building V12 supercharged PT boat engines. Three engines went in each 80 foot long plywood boat and they hustled that thing around the water at more than 55 knots. And these were remarkable boats that helped keeping shipping lanes clear in the Pacific. They also developed a um, minesweeper engine. Um, all parts were non-magnetic, so as not to set off mines in the water that detect magnetic uh, patterns around the mine. So, if you had a, an engine with a steel, magnetizable engine in a boat, that pretty much took you out of the game. But Packard developed an all non-magnetic minesweeper alloy engine uh, for um, use in World War II and the Korean War. Let's get back to what Packard was doing. They want to test their cars. I show a map here of Detroit in the teens and the Packard plant is that red dot or red hex up on East Grand Boulevard. So before there were test tracks, all automobile manufacturers were testing cars on the streets of Detroit. And Packard's favorite testing place was on Belle Isle 
because it was just a short jaunt down East Grand Boulevard to Belle Isle. They also favored some of the horse racing tracks on the far east side of Detroit. They liked to use the Detroit uh, Jockey Club for one. But that wasn't really testing. This was just pretty much breaking in a car. So they built a small test track and it wasn't much better up on the plant, up on what would be a parallel to Harper Avenue. And this is what it looked like in about 1928. Just a very simple track, just to get cars rolling around and testing them. But they wanted to do better. In fact, they wanted to do a lot better. And if Henry B. Joy had had his way, Packard would have had the country's first proving grounds. In 1915, Henry B. Joy purchased several square miles of acreage out in Macomb County. And when the board found out about it, they said, Henry, you don't need this. You got to sell that. Uh, the, the horse racing tracks and Belle Isle works just fine for us. So Henry B. Joy sold off that acreage. And he sold it to the U.S. government. And today that plot of land is known as Selfridge Air Force Base. If you ever wondered why there's the street that runs through the properties called Joy Boulevard, it's because Henry B. Joy sold the land to the government. Well, Packard wasn't the first. GM was the first. They opened up a 4,000 acre tract of land for their test track out in Milford, Michigan in 1924. And by that time, Alvin McCauley decided, you know, we've got a president of the company, decided we've got to get our own test track. And he purchased and started buying segments of land throughout uh, Macomb County at, between 22 Mile Road on the south, 23 Mile Road, Van Dyke right here, and Mound out here. And that became the Packer Proving Grounds. Campus at the time was located here with all the buildings designed by Albert Kahn, an aircraft hangar, and a series of Badland roads. This is an image taken from a, an ink blotter at the dedication ceremony when Packard, you know, everybody wants to have a party. This is part of the swag bag that the dignitaries got that came out to the opening of this multi-million dollar facility. Big sum back in those days. And to start the party off, they wanted to show everybody this uniquely designed track that Albert Kahn had put together for him, designed for him. They wanted the world have the world's fastest track. And in order to prove it, they invited an Indy race car driver, Leon DeRay. He had just set a world's record at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway just a couple of weeks prior. And they came out and had he and his racing partner driving their race cars on the Packard Proving Grounds high-speed test track. They told him, Leon, watch out when you're out there because we haven't set up all the guard gates. And right here, you'll see some of the cabling for the, for the uh, steel panels that went around the outside of the track on the curbs. And Leon said, don't worry about it. I'll be careful, but I'm not gonna use your guardrails today. And he went out and blistered the track at 148 miles an hour. That set a world's record that lasted for 54 years till it was bro broken by a track in, in uh, Nürburgring, Germany. And a couple of years ago, we were lucky enough to find the car. It was at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and they lent it to us for the 90th anniversary of the opening of the Packard Proving Grounds. And here's that very car today, where it sat in the testing garages of Packard um, back in 1928. And here's Leon uh, DeRay at the uh, timing tower at the beginning start line of the test track, uh, taken just minutes after uh, he had set that world record in his Miller special. And it was really, really an honor that uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway uh, was able to lend that car to us and we showed it off for the summer of 2018. And it was good to see Leon's car back in the same spot at the 
at the high speed, at the start finish line of the high speed test track. So you're wondering, how do I get out to the Packard Proving Grounds? Well, it's kind of easy. You're going to get in your 1930 Packard sedan. You're going to drive up Van Dyke Avenue, just like you would today. Notice this, this is uh, one lane either direction, and it's lucky to be paved at this time in 1928. And we're going to follow this 1930 sedan right up to the front gate. Well, they'll make a stop. They're going to check in with the guard, Jim Lukes. Jim will check the guy in, and you'll see Fritz the dog, the guard dog that was at the Packard Proving Ground, let them on in. Going to give you a quick aerial view of what it looked like in 1930. There were many improvements made after this. This is basically what the Packard Motor Car Foundation owns now, the 17 acres that front on Van Dyke. And here we are looking north, 22 mile road is in the foreground, 23 is at the other end of the track. And that's what it looked like then. Here was the lodge. It was the first building built. All of our buildings, except for two, were designed by Albert Kahn. And you can see that, that unique Tudor kind of gross point mansion look of the gatehouse and lodge. The reason it's called the gatehouse is the superintendent lived in this building with his family. And there were testing garages on the first floor. And on the second floor, there were a series of, um, call it dormitory rooms for test engineers that would have to live out at the proving grounds for a couple of days on end as cars were being tested out there for endurance. This is the family that lived there. Charles Vincent, there he is, to get ready to tow his Airstream uh, um, trailer on vacation. His wife, Lucille, his daughters, the youngest daughter right here, Roberta, also known as Bobby, she's still alive. And we had the honor of hosting her last summer and two of her nieces, Cornelli's daughter, Dorothea, the eldest daughter, uh, came out and were with us for three or four days and we had an excellent time and they brought us all up to speed as to what it was like to live at the Packard Proving Grounds as a kid. Now, if the name Charles Vincent sounds familiar, it's because his older brother, Jesse, was the chief engineer for Packard at that time. Both men were highly respected. Uh, both men had prior careers at the Hudson Motor Car Company designing engines. And um, uh, Jesse came first to the Packard Motor Car Company, and shortly thereafter, his, his brother Charles joined in. Jesse was uh, more, more outgoing than his brother Charles. You can see Jesse in his airplane, personal monogram on the side of his aircraft. He liked fast cars and he always had a special car that he drove around and this was his Speedster, his 1929 Packard Speedster. It still exists and four of those were built and two of them um, uh, still exist. The repair garage was the next building to be built on the site. It, it was erected in 1929. It's uh, 6,600 square feet. And this is where a car would do a 10,000 mile test in 10 days or, or a 25,000 mile test in 25 days. Cars were brought into this building and then stripped down to every nut and bolt and inspected to find out what worked well and what failed and how do we make it better? And the cars were tested on a series of 12 miles of, of what Packard called Badland Roads. There were sand pits in the corners of the racetrack. There were clay pits on opposite corners. There were steep hills to climb to see the torque, testing the torque of the engines going uphill or breaking downhill. Testing gas mileage. Here we see a car they, they claim that at uh, 30 miles an hour, this car would get about 17 miles to the gallon. So if you're doing some city driving, that's not too bad. And if you want to do 90 miles an hour, your mileage is going to get cut in half to about eight to nine gallons. 
Here are some of the sand pits where they're trying to see how much you can torque or twist the chassis, how solid the body build was. Water baths. Got to test the water integrity of these cars because when you're, when you're building America's, America's luxury car, the preeminent car, you want to make sure that none of those folks that are driving or riding the car get soaked. And when those tests were done, they were torn down to every nut and bolt and inspected to see what went wrong and what went right and how do we improve the product for the client. If you owned a V12 Packard, everyone was broken in for, for 250 miles. Rather than have your chauffeur test the car for you, Packard did it for you and you got a certificate and the keys to the car were sealed in a, on a wax seal and you were given a certificate of the car being thoroughly tested and refreshed before you received it as an owner. Let's talk a little bit about some of the records. We talked a little bit about the proving grounds. Let's talk about the records set up the proving grounds. I told you that we had two buildings that weren't designed by Albert Kahn on the campus. And one of them then was that one of those buildings was an aircraft hangar. And I told you Packard built the world's first diesel engine for an airplane. Well, the very first flight of a diesel powered aircraft came out of the hangar at the Packard Proving Grounds and took flight from the test track in September of 1928. These diesel powered, this diesel is known as the DR980, 980 cubic inches. It's a radial engine and it sipped fuel. It set all types of records on its own. It, it held a record for 55 years, the longest flight without refueling, 83 and a half hours in the air. It um, was a remarkable aircraft engine uh, that sadly came to an end when modern gas engines just got much more powerful than the diesels could keep up with. Second record that was set at the proving grounds was that diesel aircraft, because it doesn't have any spark plugs or other uh, electromagnetic generating items, doesn't cause static electricity, whereas a gas engine does. So for the first time ever at the proving grounds, Charles Vinson sat at his ham radio while an airplane circled in a, in a 25 mile radius around the proving grounds and for the first time ever talked to a pilot in flight. Before this, you could only communicate via Morse code because that strong da signal of a Morse code key could be heard over the static of the gas engine. But with a diesel, there wasn't any static and you could hear the weak radio signal that a voice was carried over through the air. Record set, 1935, Packard is introducing a new model car called the 120. It was a junior car, a little bit lux less luxurious than the senior cars Packard had been producing. And they wanted to show the public it was every bit as good as their luxury cars of the senior line. And so they conducted a continuous seven day test, 15,000 miles, average speed of 88 miles an hour. And if you notice in this car, one of the problems they had was pheasants striking the car, breaking headlights, so they're taping them together. And um, you'll see this same theme in another record I'm gonna mention in a minute or two. One of the folks I wanna mention though is this fellow right here, Carl Alts. He was a workman on the test track in 1928. He got hired by Packard in 1934 as a test track driver. He lived in Utica, Michigan. Lived in the same house for over 60 years. And he would stop by and help us as we were saving the proving grounds back in the early 2000s. 
And we always had a, a fun time with Carl because he keep us straight on all the history, the facts and what was going on. And people would come by and see us work in there and say, you know, I got a souvenir that I kept and why don't I, it really belongs here. And this sign here, stop for durability test was hung on the outside of the gates during this 1935 test run. And somebody returned it to us and Carl was there to, we all thought it came from the 55 test run. He says, no, I remember that sign. Well, Carl was a symbol of durability himself and he rung, hung around and helped us out till the day he died when he was 99 and a half years old. So a lot of the facts and figures we have are from the records he kept as a test track driver when he started with the company in 1934. He's a living legend. During World War II, not too many records were set because all car production was stopped. What Packard was doing to help the arsenal of democracy was down at Van Dyke and 11 and a half mile road, it was the Chrysler tank plant where they built Sherman M4 tanks. Well, they needed a place to test them. And just as at least the property, turned it over to Chrysler, and they would drive Sherman M4 tanks from an 11 and a half mile road to 22 and a half mile road and come into the proving grounds just as you drove a car in. And they would go up the same steep hills and water baths and clay pits that the cars were tested on before they were shipped off to war. 1949, the war is over. Packard is celebrating its 50th anniversary. The Packard brothers started the company in 1899 and 50 years later, Packard introduced the line of cars, to celebrate that golden anniversary and had a a drive away where you could come to town, your car dealer met you at the train station, took you out to the Packard Proving Grounds where they drove away your golden anniversary Packard car. So, so popular, this photograph is actually a cover from a Life Magazine article about this event. 1954, Packard set another record for their 55 automobile they're going to introduce. Packard has moved away from a straight eight engine and for the first time in 55, they're going to have a V8 engine. And don't you know, they had to build the world's most powerful V8 at the time. And they wanted to test it for durability and they ran it for 25,000 miles, set numerous AAA and mobile gas economy records. Again, the problem again is the pheasants. So much so that it broke the windshield of this car and they took a piece of plexiglass and kind of duct taped it together. And here's our guy, Carl Lalt, supervising the duct taping of that windscreen. So that car could make that 25,000 mile test run. This is what the track looked like back in 1949. And coincidentally enough, the aerial photographer was on time to see all those golden Packards sitting right there in the infield of the high-speed test track. By 1956, the year that Packard is leaving Detroit and closing this place down, they had built an engine plant to build the V8 engines and jet engines for the government out in the far uh, northwest corner of the property. But again, 56 is the year that Packard left the left Detroit, merged with Studebaker, and by 1958, the name is off, and it's just known as the Studebaker Company. 1967, for this slide, Ford Motor Company has purchased the site, and they have what they call the Utica Trim Plant, and they've been expanding the parking lot and the buildings they really don't need the bad land roads or the clay pits or the sand pits. And only once we understand it, they use the test track for some carburetor emissions testing in the uh, middle 60s. But otherwise, they left the buildings pretty much as is. 
1999, this is the year that the Packard Motor Car Foundation was founded. And this is what it looked like when we wanted to save the proven grounds. We knew we couldn't save everything, but we saved the 17 acres around this site of the property. Here was where the aircraft hangar was located. We picked it up and we moved it onto our site. Ford in the meantime has expanded the Utica trim plant and the Badlands are now gone. 2014, this aerial photograph shows what's happened. Property's been subdivided, Ford has sold it off. Condos, single family residences, are in the infield of the test track. You can barely make out the outline of the test track. And this is the closing years of the Utica trim plant. Shortly after this, it's torn down. And right now, a new Amazon Fulfillment Center is located there. And um, it's not a warehouse, mind you. It's called a fulfillment center to fulfill your dreams of getting that package from your online retailer. And here we are back to what it looks like today. But here's what we started with. It was heavily overgrown. Trees hadn't been cut in 50 and 60 years since 1956. And I mean overgrown. You could barely see some of the buildings. Our, our volunteers, we felt like lumberjacks the first couple of years. The lodge looked like this on the backside. This is how we got it. And this is what it looks like after we've cleaned it up. Same goes for our, our repair garage. I mean, it was overgrown. You could barely see that there was a building behind the trees. Here's what it looks like today. This is the tank test building. This was a, a building designed and constructed uh, during World War II. It was uh, designed by William Capp. And you'll notice that it looks very familiar to a very famous building in Michigan known as the uh, as Meadowbrook Hall. Yeah, no, not really. But it's the same architect. William Capp designed the Tilda Dodges Meadowbrook Hall and the tank test building. And this is a ceremony during the war for um, a morale building and how the uh, place had won a V for Victory Award uh, from the government. This is what it looks like today. Our timing tower. This is during one of Colonel Vincent's high-speed test runs. When we got it, we had a lot of work to do on it, replacing some of the uh, cedar shingles, a lot of paint scraping, but we finally got it to look like this. The aircraft hangar was out in the middle of the infield of the, of the test track. Well, we paid a company to pick it up and move it three quarters of a mile to our site. And eventually this will become a museum to show off Packard's aeronautical experience building aircraft engines for the war effort and the, the diesel radial engine. This is what it looks like today. And you we're real proud to, to be a partner with Motor City's National Heritage Area and um, took full advantage of their signage program. And they were able to provide us with uh, a number of signs to help explain our site to visitors as they come to walk the site. We have outdoor events. We used to have indoor events, but COVID put a stop to that. And uh, what we do now have is outdoor events again to meet the state requirements for the emergency orders where we're limited to 10 people indoors and 100 people outdoors. Well, a tent with no walls qualifies as outdoors. And so we were scheduled to have something like 65 weddings and another 30 corporate events out at the Proving Grounds, well, they all pretty much got canceled. So we decided to erect a 2,700 square foot tent and we're putting it to good use and the brides are having celebrations just like this one. So if you know anybody who's hard pressed to 
um, have a wedding, maybe they've postponed it. Now they're getting tired of waiting because they don't know when COVID's going to be over. We'd be happy to chat with them. So I'm just going to put a plug in here and advertise. Um, we're willing, ready, and able to host your wedding or corporate event under that 2,700 square foot hat. So what's up next for us? Well, we're still building on the historic preservation of the property. This is a um, work in progress. It's um, not all of our buildings have permanent certificates of occupancy. We all have temporary certificates of occupancy, but we wanna continue the restoration of the buildings, get everyone heated and air conditioned in, in order to be able to start telling and showing off our our exhibits and building interpretive um, exhibits so that we can explain uh, the testing of quality automobiles, like a legacy of craftsmanship that Packard had, and, and tell everybody about what Packard did during the war. They built the Merlin engine, they built the PT boat engine, and at the proving grounds, they tested army tanks. We've got a research library that we want to open up. We've got uh, 25,000 images from the Packard Motor Archives, and we have another 40,000 uh, blueprints that we make copies of and sell to uh, uh, restorers of cars to get those unobtainium parts that can build them themselves from the exact blueprint that Packard had. We're just trying to honor the heritage keep the Packer name alive and explain to everybody how important it was in the uh, history of automobiles. And I uh, want to pre appreciate everybody tuning in today and thanks for watching. And it's time for Ask the Man Who Owns One for questions and answers. And I'm gonna be um, stopping my sharing here and turn it over to Bob. And you'll, I guess we got a couple of quiz questions people want to know about. Well, thank you, Roger. That was a that was a fascinating presentation. I particularly love that video. I'm glad we were able to get that to work. Well, I hope we didn't, uh, I hope we didn't bore anybody, and I hope I didn't go too fast. But you know, when COVID's over, we'd welcome everybody out. Okay. Well, I would invite anyone who is uh, joining us who has a question for Roger to please uh, add your question to the Q and A uh, section. And um, we will answer those questions. We, we still have some time uh, till one o'clock. Um, we have a, a comment, more a comment uh, from our Motor Cities board member, Don Nicholson, who says um, he's going to be at the Packard Proving Ground September 12th for a wedding. Uh, so so one, of those, one of those weddings that you were able to, uh, to reschedule and do outside, uh, Don's going to be there. Well, Don will be able to explain the story he likes me to tell, but we're not going to re refresh him today. It's, it's how we got our first grant from the Motor Cities Heritage Area. And frankly, without that grant, we would not be where we are today. That grant that you folks gave us back six years ago really allowed us to pick up ourselves by the bootstraps and get moving. And we appreciate that. Okay, we've got a few questions that are coming in. Um, uh, we have a question from uh, Kevin who asks what the last days at the Packard Proving Grounds were like in 1956 and did Carl Alts ever talk about that? You know, I, I never personally got a chance to talk to Carl Alts about that, but I suspect it was much like what was happening at the plant in downtown Detroit at East Grand Boulevard. It's probably a Everybody knows that it's, the company's going to move. It's been announced. People are being laid off around you. Things are closing down. And in downtown Detroit, they were throwing away what today would be priceless artifacts. Uh, same thing was happening out at the Proving Grounds. Uh, one of the test cars known as was going to be the 57 model Packard was destroyed and cut up, disposed of. So it was a sad day all around. I mean, the Packard name had been in Detroit since, since uh, 1903, and now it's 1956, and you just can just imagine how soul-crushing that would be 
and people are going to be out of a job. Maybe they can find a, a job elsewhere in the automotive industry, but things were definitely going to change. Okay, thanks, Roger. Um, I have a question from uh, another Motor Cities uh, board member, Russ Doré, who asks if the Packard engines were there. Pack was those Packard engines in the PT boat, uh, PT one hundred and nine. Uh, that was captained by uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, our 35th president, which was rammed in the Pacific. Oh, absolutely. Every, every PT boat, patrol torpedo boat, and rescue boat built by the three wood boat manufacturers that supplied them all had Packard engines, every one. Um, only after the war did they put an Allison engine in a couple to test, but those didn't work out and they kept on building them with, with Packard engines. The three engines uh, each put out about 1200 horsepower apiece. Okay. And by the way, we have one on display when we're open for, for visits. Uh, we have that minesweeper motor I talked about and the PT boat motor on display. We also have Gar Woods for engine Miss America 10 in our engineering building, the tank test building. So there's plenty to see. If, if Russ wants to come see a, a, the genuine PT boat engine, we got one. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question from uh, Christine. Um, she asked if Packard uh, was responsible for so many innovations in the first half of the 20th century, uh, what, what exactly happened that they fell out of favor in the 1950s? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's one of the more popular questions. Uh, number one, Packard prior to the war was basically all cars were hand built. I mean, production levels in, in, in 1934 were like 6,000 automobiles. They were literally handcrafted. And Packard started the junior line in 1935 with that Model 120 I mentioned. And it was really on a mass assembly production line. Much like, um, so Packard did, it, Packard did it backwards from what um, Toyota and Honda did. Honda built and Toyota built basic cars and then they both built luxury line cars. Acura for Honda and Lexus for Toyota. Packard did it backwards. So after they stopped building the hand assembled cars, the senior cars, after the war, it was pretty much, well, if I can get the same dollars worth in a 120 or a junior car, why am I buying the senior car? And so that and also they never produced cars in great numbers like the big three did. Highest production year was 120,000 cars a year. That might be a good production number for four F-100 trucks this month. So economies of scale, Packard wasn't that profitable and um, that and um, just changing public tastes. Um, instead of building cars for the patricians, they were trying to build cars for everyday man and there were model changes so fast keeping up with GM, Ford, et cetera, just couldn't do it. Merge with Studebaker. This was the story with Hudson leaving, you know, a small independent, much like Packard, couldn't keep up, not as profitable, and they all merged and kind of dissolved after the war. Hope that helps. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Edwin. Uh, who asks, and I'm guessing this is uh, related to uh, 1999, and, and from whom did you actually purchase the, uh, the grounds from when you guys, uh, the Packard Motor Car Foundation? Well, the, uh, the technical name, it was the real estate arm of Ford Motor Company, known as Ford Motor Land Development Company. They owned the site, and we acquired it from them. Actually, they donated the front seven acres to us. We were on pretty much what would be... Uh, a leased own plan. They wanted, they were gonna charge us rent and then I said, you know what, and rather than charging your rent, we wanna make sure you guys are sincere that you can do this. So while we'll keep a book and we'll charge your rent, if you put money into the property or your time and effort, we'll account 
for that as dollars spent. So we proved ourselves. We found money. We worked at it. We were cleaning things up. It wasn't the eyesore that it was. And Ford ended up donating the front seven acres to us and the back seven acres that include parts of the test track. We eventually purchased from them at a highly discounted rate. They, they really did us a favor. And then and two years ago, uh, that we had 14 acres. And then two years ago, three years ago, we acquired an additional three acres uh, from the land developer. And uh, we're happy to have a 17 acre site now because someday we'd like to build another building, a modern building where we can have you know, an auditorium, uh, um, classrooms for education, and uh, general meeting places for the public to understand about Packard. And a more show space. Absolutely. Outstanding. Um, I've got a couple more questions uh, from Mary Sealhorst. Um, are the photos in your presentation available digitally or uh, just for in-person research? whenever that might be allowed again, wink, wink, nudge, nudge? <laughs> uh, some are in the public domain. Some can be found at, at uh, the National Automotive Historic Collection on the uh, Detroit, uh, Detroit Library webpage. Uh, some we've collected from family photographs from the Vincent family, from Carl Alts, and those are all in our files. They're, it's a long time to digitize 25,000 images. And in two years, we've been able to uh, digitize 8,200 of them. Uh, digitizing one is one part of it. It's getting all what they call the metadata on file to tell what you're looking at. So we've got a team of folks. They're out there daily. And these volunteers got those scanners just running warm. Uh, digitizing photographs for us. They'll be available shortly. If you want to come out and do some research, scheduled uh, an office visit on our website, PackardProvingGround.org, and um, we'll see what we can do to help you out. Okay. Um, our final question, and it's a, what we'd like to do it's is get all those online in low res to share, and then have them for research publication um, available at higher res for, for a fee. I see. Okay. Um, final question, and it's a, it's a good question for us to end on, and it's actually one that uh, I can feel. Uh, Mark Borowski asks, will this presentation be available online anywhere? I would like to share it with my dad. And that's, a, that's an easy one. Um, all of our Motor Cities at Home presentations um, we have the ability to uh, record them via Zoom. And what we normally do is within, within 24 hours, usually we're able to uh, get that video up and we place all of the Motor Cities at Home presentations on our YouTube page. So um, if you just uh, go to YouTube and search Motor Cities, uh, you'll be able to find all of our Motor Cities at Home presentations, the previous seven, and very soon, Motor Cities number eight, from today with Roger Luxick. So um, now we uh, would like to officially and formally thank Roger for his, uh, his time and his great presentation today. Shared a lot of wonderful history about Packard Motor Car Company and all the wonderful work that they continue to do out at the Packard Proving Grounds. Uh, we are working on a number of presentations for the month of September. Uh, so keep your eye on MotorCities.org and our social media. We'll be getting those details out to you as soon as we have those details confirmed. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you again soon. And wow. thanks for, to everyone for joining us today for Motor Cities at Home. Thanks again, Roger. And Thank we'll you, see Bob. you soon. I really appreciate it.